This is the worst video games ever iceberg. If you're watching this video, you probably already know what a video game is and that some of them have been known to be quite good. However, they can't all be Grand Theft Auto or Breath of the Wild. With an industry this big and with this much history, there's bound to be a few stinkers. And this is where this iceberg chart comes in. If you haven't been on the internet in the past half decade or so, iceberg charts are basically a way of organizing bits of information regarding a certain topic, with more well-known subjects at the top tiers and more obscure or even disturbing ones closer to the bottom. User Mr. Someone on Reddit made this iceberg chart to catalog some of the worst video games ever made. Now this isn't a definitive list by any means, and there's no real objective criteria for what is included on this list, like Metacritic scores or something like that. So if Morph Man is your favorite game ever and you're upset that it's on here, go take it up with the original OP, not me. That being said, because this list doesn't really stick to a set of rules or anything, if you've seen other videos talking about the worst games ever, I guarantee you there will be at least a few weird surprises in store here, especially the further along we go. Alright, that's enough talk. Let's go ahead ahead and dive into the worst video games ever iceberg. eFootball 2022 eFootball 2022 is a soccer or football simulation game developed and published by Konami on September 30th, 2021. Konami had originally been making a series of football games called Pro Evolution Soccer since 1995 with eFootball pretty much being a rebranding of that series, with this new one following a free-to-play model. As soon as the game came out, it was completely ripped apart by critics and fans alike who all hated the game for its horrible graphics, lack of content, and uncooperative controls. Images like these were frequently shared, showcasing the bugginess of the game. I'm assuming people got upset because these people don't actually play soccer with their mouths gaping open like this. It became the worst rated game on Steam ever within only a day of its release, with 92% of players giving it a negative review. However, in more recent times, this game has actually made a little bit of a comeback. Konami eventually apologized for the game's several glaring issues and released a big 1.0 update aimed at addressing a lot of the problems. This update fixed most of the worst bugs, but the game was still, in the words of IGN journalist Simon Cardi, a hollow shell of a football game that lacks depth, modes, and any real reason to play it consistently. However, according to more recent Steam reviews, the game seems to be doing a little bit better. The reviews are more on the mixed end instead of the negative side, and the game was rebranded as eFootball 2023 going into 2022. Superman 64 Superman The New Superman Adventures, more commonly referred to as Superman 64, is an action-adventure game made by Titus Interactive for the Nintendo 64 released in 1999. The game is based on the beloved show Superman, the animated series which aired from 1996 to 2000. The game is a three-dimensional action-adventure platformer where the player plays as the titular Superman and must save the citizens of Metropolis from a virtual reality copy of the city made by Lex Luthor. Superman can use his various powers like heat vision and freeze breath by collecting limited power-ups in certain levels. The game also includes two multiplayer modes, a racing mode and a battle mode. According to the developer, consumer feedback indicated that over 70% of 6 to 11 year olds loved the game. It was also commercially successful too, selling over 500,000 copies. Despite this, pretty much every aspect of the game was panned by critics. The controls were considered confusing and inconsistent, the soundtrack was repetitive, and the missions were too easy, with John Chapaniak from Hardcore Gaming 101 calling the missions obscenely stupid. The graphics were considered pretty basic for the time as well. There was something called Kryptonite Fog in the game, which was actually just distance fog used to hide the game's poor draw distance. Apparently a lot of the problems with the game had roots in the restrictive relationship between Warner Bros and DC with Titus Interactive. At some point there was also an attempt by Blue Sky Software to redo the game for the PlayStation, but this was ultimately cancelled. Big Rigs Racing Big Rigs Over the Road Racing is a 2003 racing game developed by Stellar Stone and published by Game Mill Publishing. In the game, the player controls a semi-truck or Big Rig racing opponents through checkpoints on truck routes throughout the United States. The game currently has a weighted 8 out of 100 score on Metacritic, which is the lowest ever for the site. GameSpot, PC Gamer, Kotaku, and GamesRadar also cited this game as one of the worst of all time. The actual problems with this game had to do with lots of really bad bugs and mostly just a lack of properly working gameplay. For example, there's no collision detection, 
The other car you're racing against won't even move. You could scale entire mountains without losing any speed, and going in reverse would allow you to accelerate indefinitely. The game's packaging says that you need to deliver cargo and avoid the police in the game, although the game has neither of these features. Multiple gaming reporters complained while reviewing the game because whatever scale they were using wouldn't allow them to give the game a zero or a negative score. Alex Carson of Hardcore Gamer argued that due to the lack of challenge, incentive to play, or even the ability to lose, Big Rigs shouldn't even technically be considered a game. Because of its status as one of the worst games of all time and its many, many bugs, Big Rigs has actually developed a small cult following. One of the most well-known parts of the game is this image of a trophy that appears when you complete a race that says your winner on it, and this image has become somewhat of a meme to those who know about the game. Flat Out 3, Chaos and Destruction. Flat Out 3 Chaos and Destruction is a 2011 action racing game developed by Team 6 Game Studios and published by Strategy First. The third installment in the Flat Out series, the gameplay consists of racing on quote unquote insane racetracks against monster trucks, race cars, off-road vehicles, and much more. The game has 9 modes and most of them are playable online with up to 16 players. The major problems with this game included weak or unfair AI, poor controls, outdated graphics, and terrible physics. The game lived up to its name though as the races were reported to be pretty pretty chaotic, and also nearly unplayable. Games Radar said that while some games are so bad they're good, Flat Out 3 is just plain bad. Balan Wonderworld Balan Wonderworld is a 2021 platformer which is the debut project of the developer Balan Company. The game was also developed by Arzest Games and published by Square Enix. With an environment inspired by musical theater, the game's story follows two children guided by the magical being called Balan, who explore 12 worlds themed after the hearts of troubled individuals. You can explore sandbox levels, collect items to progress, and use a variety of powers by unlocking themed costumes. Now, this game actually sounds not bad on paper, so what was wrong with it? According to critics, while the game had a really good art direction and music, the gameplay mechanics were just kind of tedious and boring. The game was said to be much like older 3D platformers without providing a lot of innovation. Lots of people were were confused by the lack of a clear narrative, and a lot of the gameplay wasn't explained very well in the game. The costumes that granted players their abilities had repeat abilities between them, and you could only jump by wearing certain costumes. The minigames in the game were also universally panned. Some critics noted that later levels in the game and some of the boss battles were better than other parts of the game, and most people seemed to really like the cutscenes and the music. This game isn't exactly like the games mentioned already, in that it isn't a completely broken game, just one that ended up being kind of mediocre despite some real talent behind the project. Bubsy 3D. Bubsy 3D, also known as Bubsy 3D Furbitten Planet, is a platform game developed by Edetic and published by Accolade, released in 1996 for the PlayStation. The game is the fourth installment in the Bubsy series, which features the anthropomorphic bobcat Bubsy as he battles various enemies, most notably the alien race known as the Woolies. In Bubsy 3D, Bubsy becomes stranded on the Woolies' homeworld of Rayon and has to defeat the planet's two queens, Polly and Esther, to collect rocket parts in order to escape the planet and return to Earth. Bubsy can also collect atoms that give him a variety of bonuses and abilities. The game also has two endings depending on how many rocket parts you've collected throughout the story. If you don't get all 32, then Bubsy's rocket gets stranded in outer space, but if you are able to complete your rocket with all 32 parts, the rocket ends up ripping through the time-space continuum due to the density of the atoms you've collected, which will strand Bubsy in the Stone Age. Either way, the Woolies end up invading Earth. The game received mixed reviews when it was first released, but retrospective reviews have been overwhelmingly negative. While reviewers liked the size of the levels and the new two-player mode, the most common criticisms were that the camera was disorienting and the environments were pretty bland, and also that the controls were not very precise. Bubsy speaks in the game and people found that to be pretty annoying too. Overall, people seemed to feel that the game was good for kids, who were probably more likely to enjoy the voice acting and cartoony graphics. Like I said earlier, more recent reviews of the game have been a lot Lot harsher, which compare the game unfavorably to better 3D titles from the same time like Super Mario 64. In 2015, Bubsy creator Michael Berlin called Bubsy 3D his biggest failure. Ride to Hell Retribution Ride to Hell Retribution is an action-adventure game developed by EU Technics and published by Deep Silver. Originally announced in 2008 as an open-world game, it was cancelled and then stuck in development hell until 2013 
when it was re-announced but with a new limited scope becoming a linear action game instead. The game follows motorcyclist Jake Conway as he navigates levels that include motorcycle driving segments, cover-based shooting combat, and beat-em-up melee combat as he battles the Devil's Hand, an enemy biker gang. Between levels, the player can navigate a small section of Dead End, the game's setting, to sell drugs, buy weapons, and customize their motorcycle. Pretty much every aspect of the game was hated by critics, including the broken and repetitive gameplay, bad controls, outdated graphics, poor voice acting and writing, prevalence of quick time events, awkward sex scenes, and a negative portrayal of women. Wow, that is that's, that's quite the list. Electronic Gaming Monthly stated that they didn't think there'd ever been a game that does so many things so universally poorly. Carla Ellison of Eurogamer said that women are completely, totally, transparently a resource in this game. Many people were also just disappointed that the game wasn't open world like it originally said it was. Lots of work was actually done on this original open world version of the game. Concept art, story writing, recorded dialogue, and even cutscenes that were completely motion captured before the game was essentially scrapped and remade into the version that was eventually released. The original version was scrapped reportedly because the original development studio Deep Silver Vienna shut down, but because EU Technics still owned the rights, they created a completely new game with the same title, and it just ended up being really, really bad. Duke Nukem Forever Duke Nukem Forever is a 2011 first-person shooter developed by 3D Realms and published by 2K Games. It's the fourth main installment in the beloved Duke Nukem series and the sequel to Duke Nukem 3D, which came out 15 years earlier. The game was actually announced all the way back in 1997, but was stuck in development hell due to engine changes, understaffing, and a lack of an overall plan. This game actually has the Guinness World Record for the longest development time for a video game. One could say that it took forever to come out. <laughs> As for the plot of the game, action hero Duke Nukem has become a celebrity after the events of Duke Nukem 3D, where he saved the Earth from an alien invasion. The aliens have come back, but they seem peaceful this time. After receiving an order from the president not to harm the aliens, Duke is attacked by the aliens and is forced to fight them. Because the aliens have a vendetta against Duke, they start to abduct several women, including his two pop star girlfriends. When he goes to the Duke Dome to fight the aliens, he finds the missing women who have been impregnated with aliens alien babies, and his two girlfriends both die after giving birth to aliens. Understandably, this makes Dukes pretty upset, so he kills the alien queen. He then goes to the Hoover Dam, where the alien's portal is. His dying friend Dylan gives him explosives to blow up the Hoover Dam, which he does, destroying the alien portal. After this, the president shows up and is angry with Duke because he was conspiring with the aliens to kill Duke and control Earth. The president then orders a nuclear strike on the dam to kill the aliens, and the alien emperor kills the president. Duke battles and kills the alien emperor, so he saves the day and decides to run for president himself. Okay, I know I haven't given like a huge detailed plot synopsis for the other games, but this was just so crazy that I had to talk about it. The game got pretty mixed reviews upon release, with the biggest criticisms being the long loading times, clunky controls, dated design, lack of weapons variety, and a drop in quality of the levels from previous Duke Nukem titles. It also looks like a large amount of the negative attention for the game was placed on the offensive humor and portrayal of women too, which makes sense, and many people felt it was juvenile and pretty outdated. However, some critics appreciated the return of the iconic Duke Nukem humor, with some even saying that it was the only saving grace of the game. E.T. E.T. The Extraterrestrial is a 1982 game developed and published by Atari for the Atari 2600. As the title suggests, it's based on the movie of the same name. Atari paid a reported 20 to 25 million dollars for the rights to make a game adaptation of the film and gave the project to an Atari game designer named Howard Scott Warshaw, who had only five weeks to develop the game for a planned release for the 1982 Christmas season. Warsaw took the project on as a personal challenge, and his game design saw the player control the alien E.T. from a top-down perspective to avoid enemies and obstacles in order to collect the scattered pieces of a telephone that E.T. can use to phone home. E.T. can also collect Reese's pieces, which he can use to restore his energy, receive bonus points at the end of the game, or call Elliot to get a piece of his phone. Once E.T. has all three phone pieces, the player player must find a suitable place to use the phone, after which E.T. must go to the landing zone of the spaceship that will take him home within the time limit. Once E.T. succeeds in returning home, the game restarts and the location of the phone pieces are reset. The game only ends when E.T. runs out of energy or the player decides to quit playing. 
game. Upon release, the game was criticized for its disappointing plot, convoluted gameplay, and archaic visuals. One of the most criticized parts of the game were these huge pits or wells that you have to fall into in order to collect the phone pieces, which were difficult to get out of and easy to fall back into once you did escape. Lots of people also didn't like that there really wasn't an end to the game and that it couldn't really be finished or beaten in any way. One of the other reasons this game is so infamous is because of its financial effect on Atari. Atari expected the game to do really well, so they ordered way more cartridges to be made than they usually did. The game was actually met with an initial commercial success, selling 2.6 million copies by the end of 1982. However, in the end, it's estimated that about 3.5 million out of the 4 million cartridges produced either went completely unsold or were eventually returned by dissatisfied customers. There was even one rumor that went around that there were more ET cartridges made than Atari 2600 consoles in existence. Because of the game's huge financial and critical failure, it ended up being possibly one of the major catalysts for the video game crash of 1983. There is also this urban legend about a landfill in Alamogordo, New Mexico, where most of the unsold ET cartridges were said to have been buried. In 2014, people actually went out to the landfill and found remnants of ET cartridges in other Atari games and systems, so the legend turned out to be true. Various museums around the world now have ET cartridges from this landfill on display in order to commemorate its infamous place in video game history. Sonic R Sonic R was released in 1997 and was developed by Traveler's Tales. It is the third racing game in the Sonic series and the first to feature fully 3D graphics. The player can race as 10 different Sonic characters on various Sonic themed tracks as they try to stop Dr. Robotnik from stealing the Chaos Emeralds. The game features single and multiplayer modes and while it's similar to other racing games like Mario Kart, it also includes elements like jumping and exploration. Upon release, the game received mixed reviews from critics. The game's visuals were considered pretty good for the time with people praising the lush environments and smooth 3D models with minimal visual glitches, as well as the high frame rate. The level designs also garnered praise. EGM found them to be some of the most well-designed tracks ever, and Game Informer said that the tracks were imaginative and filled with secrets. The biggest drawbacks of this game were reportedly the controls, which many found to be inaccurate, as well as the depth of the overall gameplay. The soundtrack is actually the part of the game that generated the most controversy, which included vocal elements. While some people found the music in the game extremely annoying, others said that the soundtrack was inspired and fitting of the song Sonic style. The game was later re-released in the Sonic Gems collection in 2005, where it was received far more negatively overall compared to the other games in the collection. Fast and Furious Crossroads Fast and Furious Crossroads is a racing game and action RPG based on the film franchise of the same name. Developed by Slightly Mad Studios and published by Bandai Namco, the game was released on August 7th of 2020. Crossroads allowed players to play as the main characters from the Fast and Furious franchise with a story mode and also featured an online multiplayer mode. Most of the gameplay focused on racing in exotic global locations, but in certain missions you also had to defeat enemies using weapons equipped on your car. Most critics seem to think that the game was just shallow and boring, with a short story mode poor graphics, and simply uninteresting racing gameplay. Apparently it also had a season pass for its online multiplayer mode, but players described this mode as dead on arrival, as you needed a minimum of 8 players to start a match, and that number was apparently difficult to reach at any given time, even right after release. Some critics said that only diehard fans of the series were the only ones likely to get any enjoyment out of it, but that even that might have been a stretch. The game was delisted from sale by Bandai Namco in April of 2022. Sonic the Hedgehog 06 Sonic the Hedgehog, commonly referred to as Sonic 06, is a 2006 platforming game published by Sega for the Sonic franchise's 15th anniversary. It was intended as a reboot of the series for the 7th generation of video game consoles. In the game, players control the three characters Sonic, Shadow, and Silver, who is a new character to the franchise. Each playable character has their own campaign and unique abilities, and must complete levels, explore hub worlds, and fight bosses to advance the story. In the story, Sonic, Shadow, and Silver must travel between the past, present, and future in order to stop Mephi an evil spirit, and Iblis, a demon who rules over a post-apocalyptic future while also trying to save the human character Princess Elise. The story's gameplay largely focuses on the speed-based platforming that Sonic is known for, but variations are seen on this in the game. Sonic can ride a snowboard in certain areas and can also do escort missions for the princess. In Shadow's portion of the game, there are combat-oriented sections and segments where he can ride vehicles. Silver's levels are slower and are centered on his ability to use telekinesis to defeat enemies and solve puzzles. 
levels, money is given at the end of each level or mission, with more money given depending on the player's performance in the level. This money can be used later to buy upgrades. The game also has two multiplayer modes, where players can work together to collect Chaos Emeralds or compete in a race. The game originally received pretty positive reception during its pre-release showings, with much praise going towards the graphics and environments. However, when the game was released, it faced widespread negative reception. While the game's graphics before release were praised, some ultimately felt that they were bland and only a minimal improvement over the previous console generation, with also many citing a variety of graphical glitches. Many other problems were identified, such as bad level design, slow loading times, difficult controls, and a frustrating camera system, which reviewers cited as the cause of most deaths. Many also felt that the supporting cast of characters didn't add much to the game, and they would have rather just played as Sonic. The plot in particular was said to be confusing and strangely dark, with the romance between Sonic and the human Princess Elise particularly criticized. Eurogamer said that the voice acting was painful and that the cutscenes were cringeworthy. The game appears to not have aged very well either. While the game was supposed to be a breath of fresh air for the series after a string of poor games, this game once again left Sega to rethink their direction of the franchise. In fact, the game was delisted along with other Sonic games in 2010 as Sega wanted to remove all Sonic games with low Metacritic scores to increase the franchise's value. Most of the characters introduced in the game have made few appearances since, and the official Sonic Twitter account has mocked the game in the past. The next main Sonic game, Sonic Unleashed, mostly ignored the gritty tone of its predecessor and received better reviews. DDI Platformers so this entry is referring to four platforming games released by the game studio Data Design Interactive between 2005 and 2008. These titles are Ninja Bread Man, Anubis II, Myth Makers, Trixie in Toyland, and Rock and Roll Adventures. If you're wondering why this entry includes four different games, it's because the four games all use the exact same engine and are essentially just reskins of each other. All these games have the exact same gameplay, including three levels plus a tutorial, the goal of having to collect eight power rods, the same basic attacks and enemies, the same music, and even the same bugs and glitches. Wii versions of the game were also released, which allow the player to swing weapons using motion controls, be it a samurai sword in Ninja Bread Man or a guitar in Rock and Roll Adventures. The first game that was released, Ninja Bread Man, was supposedly originally pitched as a third entry in the Zool 2D platforming series, and evidence of this has been found in the game, such as Zool-themed levels and items being included in the code. Although Ninja Bread Man is the most well-known or infamous of these games, all of the games received very very low ratings from critics, mostly due to the sloppy and uninteresting gameplay, bad controls, frame rate issues, and an abundance of bugs. In the IGN review for Trixie in Toyland, the reviewer said that the game is really just a fantastic title like Ninja Bread Man and Anubis II. Everyone should experience Trixie in Toyland just as everyone should experience throat cancer. A sequel to Ninja Bread Man titled Ninja Bread Man Blades of Fury was announced in 2008, but it was never released and Data Design Interactive later went out of business in 2012. Daikatana Daikatana is a first-person shooter developed by Ion Storm and published by Eidos Interactive in 2000. The game follows a swordmaster named Hiro Miyamoto from the year 2455 as he travels to various locations and time periods to end an ancient conflict between two rival clans in feudal Japan, the Ibihara and the Mishima. The story is split between 24 levels divided between four episodes where the player explores 25th century Japan, ancient Greece, Dark Ages Norway, and near future San Francisco. When the game first came out in 2000, it received mediocre reviews, but retrospective analysis is far more harsh. One of the biggest areas of criticism for the game is the sidekick system. Throughout the story, you battle alongside two sidekicks, Mikiko Ibihara and Superfly Johnson. If either one of these sidekicks dies, you fail the mission or level, and because the AI in the game is so bad, this happens very often. Another widely criticized feature was that there were a limited number of times you were allowed to save in any given level. It also lagged behind some of its contemporaries like Quake 2 in the graphics department because of its delayed development. There was also a little bit of controversy surrounding the game and its marketing, specifically this advertisement referencing game designer John Romero, which said, John Romero is about to make you his bitch. Left Alive Left Alive is a 2019 stealth video game developed by Illinx and published by Square Enix. A game in the Front Mission series, the story follows a group of survivors trying to navigate the surprise invasion of their Eastern European home country. The player can control three protagonists, Mikhail, a pilot who must grapple with the loss of his fellow soldiers, Olga, a police captain, and Leonid, a rebel leader accused of murder. Gameplay largely centers around stealth and survival as well as third-person shooting elements. Players must evade enemies or defeat them with improvised weapons. Other activities 
include getting other survivors to safety or flying winds or planes, and the game also includes dialogue options with certain NPCs that can affect the story. The game was released to widespread negative reviews, and the major criticisms focused on gameplay elements such as a poor physics engine. One example of this poor physics were instances where an enemy was shot and killed, their bodies would jump into the air before falling to the ground. Jason Faulkner of Game Revolution cited unpredictable AI as another problem and said that the enemies would either never miss the player or would ignore them completely. While some players praised the setting, soundtrack, art direction, and plot, the voice acting was said to be pretty hit or miss and certain plot revelations had no impact because of a lack of proper story setup. Rogue Warrior Rogue Warrior is a 2009 first-person shooter developed by Rebellion Developments and published by Bethesda. And the background of this game's premise and its main character are a little crazy. The game shares its title with the autobiography of a man named Richard Marcinko, who was a U.S. Navy SEAL commander and a veteran from the Vietnam War. Marcinko commanded an experimental cell of Navy SEALs called Red Cell that was used to expose the security weaknesses of U.S. military properties around the world. Red Cell was able to infiltrate supposedly impenetrable high-security bases, nuclear submarines, and other secure areas, including Air Force One. Marcinko would eventually be convicted on charges of conspiracy to defraud the government in 1980, apparently because he had defrauded the government over the price of contractor acquisitions for hand grenades. Marcinko would claim that he was the subject of a witch hunt by various U.S. Army officers because he had embarrassed them during his work with Red Cell and had exposed weaknesses in U.S. security. Marcinko would end up spending 21 months in federal prison and would be fined $10,000 for his charges. All of this is chronicled in his autobiography titled Rogue Warrior which he co-wrote with ghostwriter John Wiseman. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly does all this have to do with the 2009 video game called Rogue Warrior? And I'm here to let you know that this has nothing to do with the 2009 video game titled Rogue Warrior. Suck my balls, my hairy fucking big balls. Despite being named after the book, which is based on true events, and even the fact that the main character in the game is named Richard Marcinko, the actual storyline of the game has nothing to do with any real-world Navy SEAL missions led by Marcinko. The storyline is completely fictional. I just wanted to make that aside because I found this story really interesting. I feel like the point of these iceberg videos is to investigate the bizarre or unknown areas of a certain topic and uncover weird stories that you might not have otherwise known about. I didn't even mention things like how Marcinko claimed to have witnessed Navy SEALs eating the brains of a live monkey to impress some Cambodian allies or that Marcinko would go on to write 16 sequels to his autobiography that have completely fictional storylines where Marcinko himself is still the main character. This guy is just a whole rabbit hole on his own. Anyway, enough about that, let's move on to the actual game. The plot revolves around a character named Richard Marcinko, a veteran US Navy SEAL on a mission in North Korea to locate and destroy a set of secret North Korean nuclear missile launchers. The game was delayed for a couple of years after being under development by Zombie Studios, but that version of the game was scrapped by Bethesda after they were unhappy with the direction they were going in and gave the project to Rebellion Developments. When the game did come out, pretty much every part of the game was criticized, notably the poor controls, multiple major glitches, outdated graphics, a rushed production, and uninteresting gameplay, kind of the same sonic dance we've seen with other games in this iceberg. The game also drew heavy criticism for its overuse of profanity, its short length, limited multiplayer modes, and combat techniques that were just completely broken. IGN said that in the stealth sections of the game, 90% of the enemies have their backs turned to you at all times, so you can just charge them and take them out, no problem. The hit detection was also all over the place, and the accuracy of weapons was said to be horrible. You could line up the reticle and it would just completely miss. But really, I could go on and on about this game and how bad reviewers said each and every part of this game is, but we would be here all day, so let's just move on. The Quiet Man the Quiet Man is a 2018 action-adventure game developed by Human Head Studios and published by Square Enix. The story follows a deaf protagonist named Dane, who is pursuing a masked man who has kidnapped a woman who looks like his mother, and he must beat up a bunch of people in order to save her. The gameplay almost entirely consists of full-motion videos and long cutscenes, and players have the most freedom during combat scenes where they can punch, kick, and grab opponents. One of the most uh, unique design choices in this game was for there to be no sound and also no subtitles in order to simulate the experience experience of the deaf main character. This was cited as one of the worst parts of the game as you really couldn't figure out what was going on at all, you couldn't figure out who was related to who or what anyone was saying. The story would still progress as Dane clearly understood what people were saying, but the player would be left completely oblivious to the overall narrative. The game was actually patched a week after release to include a second playthrough which adds in subtitles for the missing dialogue, but you have to play the entire game a full time once before you can unlock this version of the dialogue. The other important element of the game, the combat, was also 
also really bad. Although you do have the options to punch or kick or grab enemies, those options don't end up really mattering very much in the end because the enemies are all very simple and easy to defeat no matter what moves you decide to use. Although the combat is so simple and easy, there are still a variety of problems with enemies phasing through objects or just standing waiting to get hit. Overall, the theatrical parts of the game actually were the best received among critics, even if most people didn't like the experience overall due to the aforementioned lack of any sound. Zelda CDI so this entry is referring to three different games published by Philips Interactive Media based on the Legend of Zelda franchise, titled Link, The Face of Evil, Zelda, The Wand of Gamelon, and Zelda's Adventure, all made for the short-lived Compact Disc Interactive System, or CDI. Like a lot of games on this list, the reviews for the three games were pretty mixed when they first released, but have only gotten worse over time. The first two games, Faces of Evil and The Wand of Gamelon, which were developed at the same time and by the same team, received similar reviews upon launch. At the time of their release, the animatic sequences were praised by some, as well as the graphics and usage of sound and speech elements. However, the slow and repetitive gameplay was criticized, as well as the controls. Zelda's Adventure had a different game engine and development team than the other two games, and is one of the few legends of Zelda games that allow the player to play as Zelda. This game is also the only Legend of Zelda game to feature live action cutscenes. Compared to the other two games, contemporary reviews for Zelda's adventure were on average far more harsh, and the acting in the cutscenes was considered unprofessional. Move the controller down, and I crouch. When I'm crouching, you can make me do the duck walk! This game also couldn't produce music and sound effects at the same time, which was considered distracting. The gameplay was also considered very difficult due to the frustrating level design, which some described as a guess and check simulator trying to figure out which items worked on which enemies, as well as the inconsistent frame rate and unresponsive controls. It's also worth noting that all three games are now considered non-canon to the overall Zelda timeline, or timelines, and have pretty much been ignored by Nintendo for years, not seeing any re-releases or making it onto any collection titles. This has made them quite rare over the years, and copies of any of the games regularly sell for around $100. In spite of, or probably because of, their terrible quality, these three games actually saw a resurgence of relevance around 2006 with Zelda CDI remixes, which are basically mashup or parody videos based on the animated cutscenes from the games. These videos are considered some of the earliest examples of the YouTube poop genre of YouTube videos. Sid the Dummy Sid the Dummy, or CID the Dummy? I don't know. Is a 3D platformer adventure game developed by Game Studio 12 Games and published by Oxygen Games in 2009. The story revolves around two scientists who were once colleagues but are now bitter rivals. After one of his experiments goes awry, the game's villain, D. Troit, creates an army of robots and kidnaps the daughter of his old colleague, B.M. Workin. To save his daughter, Workin creates a crash test dummy named Sid for Crash Impact Dummy to defeat Detroit and his army. This story has been noted to share numerous similarities with Mega Man for the NES. Throughout the game, Sid comes off as an unlikable protagonist, claiming that he never cared about the safety of Workin's daughter and that he went on the mission as an opportunity to cause trouble for his own amusement. Upon release, the game received negative reviews for its lackluster gameplay, sluggish controls, poor graphics, and terrible voice acting. The game also garnered some controversy for just straight up plagiarizing certain elements, such as images used in certain levels, but most notably a poor cover of Fatboy Slim's Weapon of Choice for the Wii startup menu and using Final Fantasy VII's Let the Battles Begin track on a driving level. The game was actually remade or demade in 2019 as a 2D side scroller. The newer game received similar criticisms to the first, such as poor and imprecise controls, lackluster audio elements, and a bad story, as well as numerous typos in the text and a perceived lack of replay value. Indiana Jones Staff of Kings Wii Version Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings is an action-adventure game based on the Indiana Jones series of films and was published by LucasArts and released in 2009. Much of the game takes place in a linear structure, with gameplay elements such as puzzles and obstacles to be cleared and enemies to defeated by Indy using hand-to-hand -hand combat, guns, or elements of the environment. Plot follows Indy in his search for the magical Staff of Moses, traveling the world to locations such as Nepal, Sudan, and Panama. Although the game was also released for the PS2, PSP, and Nintendo DS, the version that this iceberg entry can concerns is specifically the Wii version. This version includes some extensive features not found in the other versions, most notably motion controls that allow the player to throw punches or use a whip while playing as Indy. The Wii version also included an exclusive co-op story mode as well as another game, the point-and-click title Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, which released in 1992 as an unlockable. Most versions of the game received pretty mixed reviews. IGN cited the interface, graphics, variety of extras, interactivity, and variety of gameplay as strong points 
In fact, the extra content, including the co-op story, deathmatch mode, and the fate of Atlantis unlockable game were cited as the game's best features by many. Others also praised the story and the voice acting. However, GameSpot criticized the allegedly terribly laid out checkpoints and the out-of-date visuals. The Wii version in particular received much ire from most critics. The AV Club called the motion controls inexcusable, claiming they weren't even passably responsive and that the best part of the game was the inclusion of Fate of Atlantis. Charlie's Angels Charlie's Angels is a 2003 beat-em-up 3D platformer developed by Neko Entertainment and published by Ubisoft for the PS2 and GameCube. Based on the 2000 film of the same name, the game follows three private investigators as they try to solve the mysterious disappearance of national monuments, attacking groups of enemies along the way using punches, kicks, and blunt weapons. This game seems to have been plagued with a variety of issues. One of the biggest irritations for playing the game seems to have been the fact that invisible walls will appear during combat, making movement quite difficult. The combat wasn't that especially interesting either, with Matt Casamassina of IGN citing a shallow execution of jittery fight moves in a centimeter deep combo system, as well as extremely basic controls. The graphics were also criticized, particularly concerning the women whose blocky and stiff in-game models were compared unfavorably to their live-action counterparts. Aquaman Battle for Atlantis Aquaman Battle for Atlantis is a 2003 action-adventure game developed by Lucky Chicken Studios and published by TDK for the Xbox and GameCube, based on the Aquaman comics. In the game, the player plays as Aquaman as he swims through levels and fights enemies in order to save his kingdom of Atlantis from the villains Black Manta and Ocean Master. Most of the game's aspects were heavily criticized by critics, especially the game's overall design. IGN's Matt Casamassina, who also reviewed the last entry, said the levels all felt repetitive and empty, with invisible barriers restricting exploration exploration and levels filled with nothing but fog and empty submerged buildings. The storytelling in the game was pretty bare bones, with the game's story being told exclusively through cutscenes that were little more than comics, with pictures and text but no voice acting. Overall, it seems that Battle for Atlantis is simply a boring, shallow, and forgettable title meant solely to cash in on the Aquaman IP. Batman Dark Tomorrow Oh man, two DC games in a row? Batman Dark Tomorrow is a 2003 action stealth game developed and published by Chemco for the GameCube. It was initially announced as an open world game based on the Batman comics, but the delayed end result was a linear game and also an unplayable, bug-ridden mess, according to all who played it. While the cutscenes and story were praised by critics, the actual gameplay was reportedly horrendous. In order to not be discovered by enemies, the player was forced to move Batman at an excruciatingly slow pace, and this stealth mechanic was an integral part of the game which made it unavoidable for the player. The graphics were considered poor and underdeveloped even for the time, the camera moved too much, and the gameplay was extremely glitchy. Andrew Reiner of Game Informer gave the game 0.75 out of 10, calling it incomprehensible and littered with bugs. But the most hated part of this game was its ending. The final boss of the game is Ra, who has set up bombs all over the world with the potential to kill a third of the world's population. In order to get the good ending, the player as Batman has to disarm Ra's signal device before the final battle. However, this objective is not made clear to the player whatsoever, and so during the initial release, the majority of players got one of the three bad endings, which created widespread confusion. Following the overwhelming negative reception, a planned PlayStation 2 version of the game was cancelled. Rambo the Video Game Rambo the Video Game is a 2014 on-rails shooter game developed by Taeyeon and published by Reef Entertainment for the PC and PS3. The game adapts various scenes from the films Rambo First Blood, Rambo First Blood Part 2, and Rambo 3, and sees the player take the role of John Rambo to fight enemies using various weapons, as well as stealth, cover, and demolition systems. Other notable elements include a Wrath mechanic, where you gain special abilities such as regeneration from killing enemies, as well as Troutman challenges that encourage players to replay completed levels. Despite the faithfulness to the source material, the gameplay overall was rife with issues, with critics citing the generic on rail style, large number of quick time events, poor enemy AI, and a short three and a half hour campaign as the major criticisms. Overall, the gameplay seemed to simply consist of hovering the reticle over an enemy and shooting them at the correct time with very little variety or depth, and even the additional modes and challenges weren't enough to keep players coming back to play the uninteresting gameplay. IGN called it an unmitigated waste of time, and Destructoid called it an unpolished and uninspired, stating that even the act of shooting doesn't feel impactful or fun. The game also reportedly did not run too well and crashed and froze quite frequently. Also, the website for the game is still up if you want to check that out. 
Popeye 2021. Popeye is a 2021 platformer developed by Sabek Limited and released on the Nintendo Switch. The game is actually a remake or reimagining of the original 1982 arcade game Popeye, which was generally considered to be a well-liked and fairly nuanced platformer with decent visuals and enjoyable gameplay, and has received a fair number of other spin-offs and remakes. In both the 2021 remake and the original, the main gameplay objective is to collect various items dropped by olive oil while avoiding enemies and traversing between four different levels. The player as Popeye can punch various items to damage enemies or cans of spinach and to become invincible for a limited time. Like I said, the original 1982 arcade version was well received and became fairly iconic, but the 2021 Nintendo Switch remake was very poorly received. The graphics were heavily criticized, and the game was even accused of asset flipping as it uses Unity Store assets, animations from the website Mixamo, and even fan-made 3D models of the characters. Other poorly utilized elements are the official Popeye artwork that appears throughout the game on menus and between stages, and the Popeye theme that plays indefinitely and isn't even loot properly. On top of that, the game has lag spikes, poor controls, and inconsistent collision detection. In the words of Popeye himself, That's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. Chicken Blaster and Chicken Shoot Chicken Shoot, also known as Chicken Blaster, is a 2000 arcade-style shooter game developed by Toon Tracks and released on Windows, Mobile, Nintendo DS, Wii, and Game Boy Advance. The gameplay is basically what it sounds like. You shoot chickens. Essentially, it's Duck Hunt, but with chickens. Also, the chickens are weirdly humanized in a lot of instances. For example, here's one chicken that's just washing her clothes, and you're gonna shoot her? There are different locales to visit and some unique hand-drawn 2D graphics, as well as a multiplayer mode and an egg-catching minigame, but overall the gameplay doesn't seem to be all that deep or interesting. While the original PC version and the GBA port received positive to mixed reviews, I believe the Wii version is what this entry is referring to specifically, as it seems to be the only one regularly cited as one of the worst games of all time. This is likely due to the fact that not only was the Wii insanely popular, but also because it is a huge dumping ground for shovelware such as this, especially when the shovelware has the potential for, you guessed it, motion controls. I mean, I honestly don't have too much to say about the game beyond that. Shitty gameplay, shitty motion controls, that's, that's about it. <laughs> Reboot, PS1. Reboot is a 1998 3D shooter platformer game developed and published by EA for the PlayStation. Based on the television show of the same name, the story follows Bob, a guardian who lives inside a computer who must protect his home, the mainframe, from the villainous Megabyte, who plans to take over the mainframe using the power of energy tears. As Bob, the player's goal is to mend these tears and defeat enemies within a certain time limit, getting better weapons and useful abilities along the way. Unlike a lot of games on this list, Reboot seems to have been overall an okay game, mediocre at worst, with most game publications ranking it somewhere between 4 and 7 out of 10. Critics seem to be in an agreement that while the game doesn't revolutionize anything in terms of graphics or gameplay, and had a few notable issues concerning the camera movement and some half-baked control schemes, many consider it a decent game that managed to be fun without being overshadowed by the show it was based on. Batman and Robin Man, this list has not been kind to DC, has it? Batman and Robin is a 1998 action-adventure game based on the 1997 film of the same name, developed by Probe Entertainment and published by Acclaim Entertainment for the PlayStation. A sandbox-style game, the player travels around Gotham City as Batman, Robin, or Batgirl to complete various missions and interact with various events that happen at certain times. For example, Mr. Freeze will always try to rob a bank at 7pm, as well as other situations that are derived from the plot of the movie or uniquely created for the game itself. Unfortunately, just like the film it was based on, the game was unsuccessful, both critically and commercially. Next Generation's review likened it to Acclaim's other poor licensed games, which include The Punisher, Ultimate Payback, and The Simpsons' Bartman Meets Radioactive Man. IGN said that the only people likely to buy this game were Batman fanatics. However, some aspects of the game were praised, such as the detail-oriented graphics and sound design, but beyond some small details that Batman fans seemed to enjoy, the gameplay just really wasn't up to snuff. Also, the game did win most faithful use of a movie license at the 1998 OPM Editors Awards, so credit where credit's due. Jerry Rice and Nidus Dog Football Jerry Rice and Nidus Dog Football is a 2011 sports game developed by Judo Baby and released for the Wii and Steam. The gameplay isn't much more than a family-friendly American football simulator with all the normal rules, except the players are dogs. 
except for the quarterback, he's human. Reportedly, the game fit the family-friendly vibe by making the gameplay extremely simple, as controlling your dog's path is as simple as pointing the Wii remote at the screen. Overall, it seems that while the premise might turn some people off from the game, the entire game is built with the dogs in mind, from the courses to the costumes, as it all seems to mesh together pretty well. Interestingly, it seems that most of the reviews for this game actually lean pretty heavily towards the positive side. Almost all the reviews on Steam and Metacritic seem to be positive or mixed, and several of them repeat the quote, the graphics, that's, you know, that's what this is all about. Which, after some digging, I found was lifted from this interview with Jerry Rice when he was promoting the game. The graphics. That's, you know, that's really what this is all about. Ultimately, it seems that the biggest problems people had with the game were some instances of choppy performance and the fact that the titular Jerry Rice and Nidus weren't available from the start and have to be unlocked. So really, it's a little hard to tell if some of these positive reviews are ironic or not, but there appears to be a fair amount of people who have a real genuine love for this game, if not at least for its bizarre yet charming premise and gameplay. Cheetah Men 2 Alright, so we've got a pretty wild one on our hands here, so you're going to want to strap in. Cheetah Men 2 is the unreleased sequel to the 1991 NES game Cheetah Men, one of the 52 games on the unlicensed Action 52 multi-cartridge created by the now-defunct Active Enterprises. This video game was about human-cheetah hybrids created by a mad scientist named Dr. Morbus. No, not Morbius. The designs and weapons of the three Cheetah Men are inspired by Greek mythology, and they are thus aptly named Apollo, Ares, and Hercules. The story involves them rebelling against Dr. Morbus and fighting his other animal-human hybrids. While the game may look lackluster to us now in 2023, Cheetah Men was actually praised for its good music and the gameplay was said to be much more interesting compared to other games on the multi-card. However, the mediocre quality of Cheetah Men did not help with the overall negative reception of the Action 52 cartridge due to the astonishingly poor quality of the other 51 games, so ultimately the sequel, Cheetah Men 2, was cancelled mid-production in 1992. Cheetah Men 3 was also planned by Active Enterprises as an exclusive game for their new console called the Action Game Master, but both the game and the console were never completed due to Active cancelling all their gaming projects in 1994. In 1996, 1,500 cartridges containing the unfinished Cheetah Men 2 game were discovered in a warehouse and then sold on eBay as a collector's item for NES fans. The copies had six of the ten planned levels, but contained bugs which made two of the levels inaccessible and other levels completely unbeatable. A ROM hacker named Paco-chan fixed the bugs to make the game at least somewhat playable. The rarity of Cheetah Men 2 copies in its meager, unpolished state inspired a kind of cult following, prompting a Kickstarter to actually finish it. The project was created by Greg Pabich, entitled Cheetah Men 2 The Lost Levels, and became fully funded with over a thousand backers. Cheetah Men 2 The Lost Levels is still available online on its own website, which touts it as the most notorious NES game ever produced. Spider-Man The Sinister Six PC. Marvel Comics Spider-Man The Sinister Six is a 1996 game developed by Brooklyn Multimedia and published by Byron Priest Multimedia Company Inc. for the PC. The game titled Marvel Comics Spider-Man The Sinister Six seems to be a side-scrolling point-and-click adventure game where you talk to people and solve puzzles. The player reads through the narrative by choosing branching event paths, resulting in a total of six storylines and endings. Throughout his journey, Spider-Man can come across one of the members of the Sinister Six, such as Dr. Octopus and Mysterio, and will have to defeat them in a boss fight mini game. All right, I'm going to be honest with you guys. There is not a whole lot that I could find about this game online other than some gameplay. At first, I thought this entry might be referring to two other games, perhaps Return of the Sinister Six or Spider-Man 2 The Sinister Six, but those two games got fairly positive reviews and didn't come out on the PC. Beyond a brief description and a little bit of gameplay footage, I really can't find too much about this game, especially in the way of reviews, but the site that seems to have the most information on it, which is Moby Games, says that Power Unlimited gave it a 6 out of 10 and two other publications gave the game a 1 out of 5. If I were to guess, based on the gameplay footage that we do have available, I'm assuming the game is disliked because it doesn't seem that interesting. You can hardly move in the game, with most of the action you get being walking around and talking to people or standing still while you shoot a web in a boss fight. There seems to be some cutscenes that could be interesting and the voice acting isn't all that bad, but nothing in the game really looks that good. The pixel art looks extremely basic and oftentimes they will pair it with 3D models that just make it look more awkward. Also, I don't know if this is just how games sounded back in the day, but listening to the background music for this game made me nauseous after about 30 seconds of listening. Keep in mind, in 1996 we got Quake, Super Mario 64, and Resident Evil, so this game seems to be extremely primitive and lackluster considering the era that it came out in.
Gundam 79, The War for Earth. Gundam 0079 The War for Earth is a 1997 FMV or interactive movie game developed by Presto Studios and published by the Bandai Digital Entertainment Corporation. The game also has the distinction of being the only officially released Gundam game developed by an American developer. Now I'm not all that well versed in Gundam lore or know exactly how this game does or doesn't fit into the pre-existing Gundam universe, but the plot appears to broadly follow the events of the original 1979 anime series Mobile Suit Gundam where spacefaring armies use mobile robotic Gundam suits in order to fight. The protagonist of the game is a young civilian who must pilot one of these Gundam suits after the original pilot was crushed by debris during a battle. After this, the protagonist is asked to stay with the heroic Earth Federation on their ship, White Base, and aids them in their war against the villainous Char Asnabal on various dangerous missions. The game was not very well received by critics. The graphics overall were praised, but some found the integration of the live action elements to be a little odd or unnatural. The overall inter interface was pretty heavily criticized, with some complaining that it was too complicated and made the game difficult, as the interface included four directions of movement, five weapons, a shield, and an action button. Some just didn't like the nature of the game itself, because as an interactive movie, most of the action was done through the use of quick time events. The game was also noted in the Gundam community for its variety of quirks, including the fact that the main character is often referred to as Gundam, even though that's what the suits in the universe are called. The Gundam suit is also apparently hurt by things in the game that it just wouldn't be damaged by in the original series, such as landmines. Char Aznable, the main villain, is also portrayed by an older actor than how his character is usually portrayed in the show, which drew ridicule from the Japanese fanbase, who also noted the actor's large cleft chin, which inspired various nicknames like Chin Comet and Char Agonable, with Ago being Japanese for chin. Pac-Man, Atari 2600 a version of Pac-Man was ported to the Atari 2600, developed and published by Atari and released in 1982 two years after the original Pac-Man arcade game. It essentially follows the same gameplay of the original, but differs in a few key aspects. The design is oriented landscape-wise instead of portrait mode, which basically means that it was wider than it is tall, which is the reverse of the original game. The ghosts behave differently as well, doing away with the brief rest states present in the original, as well as not respawning until any power pill effects expire. Other notable changes include the fact that Pac-Man does not face up or down when moving in those directions, only facing left or right, and the game also removed most of the original audio effects such as Pac-Man's signature Waka Waka noise. The game was a massive critical success and still stands as the best selling game ever for the Atari 2600 with over 8 million copies sold and was actually the best selling video game of all time at one point. However, the game was despised by critics, not really because of the small changes made to the gameplay, but because of the visual differences which many felt robbed the game of its original charm and not all of these visual annoyance seem to be a purposeful stylistic choice. For example, the ghosts take turns appearing on the screen, creating a flicker effect that was widely criticized and tired the player's eyes. In response to the criticisms, game developer Todd Fry said that he didn't regret his work on the game, but said we would have done things differently if they had worked with a ROM that had more capacity, and that the game taught a lesson about keeping the social and cultural context and appeal of the original source. The Grinch, PS1 the Grinch is a 3D platformer game based on a live-action film of the same name and released by Konami in 2000 alongside the movie. In the game, the player plays as the Grinch as he seeks to find the blueprints he needs to make gadgets to terrorize the citizens of Whoville. His blueprints have fallen from his home in Mount Crumpet and have landed in various parts of Whoville and Wholand, such as the Who Forest, Who Lake, and Whoville Municipal Dump. The Grinch can jump, ground pound, and use his stinky breath to work his way past obstacles and puzzles so he can recover his gadgets and finally steal Christmas. While a number of reviewers seemed to enjoy the game a fair amount, saying that it probably had the most appeal towards kids, others thought it was just average or mediocre, and quite a few more were hung up on the game's myriad of problems. Control and camera issues were cited by some reviewers who noted that the certain acrobatic platforming moves the Gritch had to perform were difficult to accomplish with the joystick. However, those that did enjoy the game actually had quite a bit to say about what they liked. Many positive reviews seemed to highlight the faithfulness of the visuals to the film and Dr. Seuss's books, and just the sheer joy of playing as the malevolent Grinch, as well as the nonlinear gameplay that allowed for completing levels out of order and encouraged returning to old levels once new gadgets were unlocked. Yaris 
Yaris is a racing game developed by Castaway Entertainment and published by Backbone Emeryville for the Xbox Live Arcade in 2007. If you know a thing or two about cars, which I do not, then you might recognize the name of the game, and yes, this game was licensed by Toyota and is named after their line of Yaris cars. The game is a futuristic combat racing game where you can play as three different Yaris models, all of which have a prehensile robotic gun called a Mecho Symbiont that comes from the hood and can shoot lasers. They seriously wasted this concept on an advertisement game for the Toyota Yaris. The tube-shaped racing tanks are populated with enemies such as MP3 flares and flaming tires, which the player can shoot with their Mecho Symbiont in order to obtain coins. These coins can be used to upgrade the vehicle with better weapons, shields, or a new paint job. Even though the game was completely free to play, the reviews it got from critics were quite scathing. Mike Flacey from VideoGameTalk.com contemplates, As the title is completely free, you should ask yourself different questions related to value. For instance, is the title worth the 17.5 seconds it will take to download it? You could take out the trash in that amount of time, a much more rewarding task than playing Yaris. This sentiment of not being worth the free price was shared throughout virtually all of the reviews that exist for the game, save for one by Frank Karen of Ars Technica, who called the game the Xbox Live Arcade sleeper hit of the year. Morph Man Morphman is a 1993 interactive CGI movie game released for Windows and is the only game developed and published by Dynamic Dimension Entertainment Inc. Morphman follows the titular Morphman as he must save his creator, a professor, from the lair of his kidnappers who want to use his research for evil. Morphman can use special technology to scan objects and living things in order to analyze their molecular structure so that he can morph into them, using their abilities and size to help him on his quest. Some elements of Morphman were enjoyed by reviewers, mostly in a so-bad-it's-good quality, with the character of Morphman being ridiculous to the point of likability, and some, such as reviewer magazine Joystick, cited the good quality of the video and textures for the time. The gameplay was heavily criticized, however, as it is essentially just a guessing game of what button you need to press in order to choose the right action to progress, with the player having to restart at a certain point every time Morphman dies. Overall, while it seems that the game was an interesting experiment to test the technology of the time, there wasn't all that much you could really do, and even when you did manage to trial and error your way through the game's story, there wasn't all that much to it, anyway. Orc Slayer Orc Slayer is a 2015 arcade-style first-person shooter developed by Coopley Studios and released for PC and PS4. The game is more or less what the title suggests. You slay orcs, using a special crossbow and a variety of bolts while also using experience points gained from the orc slaying to upgrade your signature weapon. Although some reviewers praised the faithfulness to the premise, most agreed that the game was a complete waste of time, even at the sale price of $2. Game-breaking glitches were abound in the game, with the game always freezing before the final boss, making it completely unbeatable. The game also reportedly performed very poorly, and the consensus on the graphics is that they well, left something to be desired. All in all, it seems that if you're looking for a cheap, exciting, fantasy FPS experience, you might want to look elsewhere. 101 Explosive Megamix 101 Explosive Megamix is a minigame collection developed by Nord Current and published by Atlas for the Nintendo DS in 2008 and for the Wii in 2011. Reportedly featuring 10 hours worth of 101 minigames, the collection utilizes the touchscreen of the DS or the Wii Remote on the Wii to play a variety of games ranging from racing, sports games, space combat, match 3, Sudoku, Jigsaw Puzzle, etc. High scores in the games earn players gold coins that can be used to unlock more games, with only 10 games being unlocked from the start. The game received mixed results reviews on the DS, but especially bad reviews for the Wii, which seems to be a recurring theme of Wii ports, receiving even worse reviews than whatever original version it had. Lucas Balicki for Nintendo World Report said that while some of the games could be considered remotely fun, others felt like a chore, with most being poor and forgettable. Thomas East of Official Nintendo Magazine UK said it would be difficult to unlock all 101 games, but that all of them are so abysmal that you'd not even want to bother, not one of them living up to the standard of the average Flash game. Nintendo Gamer went so far as to say that Explosive Megamix is about as welcome as Explosive Diarrhea. Elf Bowling 1 and 2 Elf Bowling is a bowling video game series developed and released by Endstorm for PC. The first game, Elf Bowling, it was released for 1998 for PC and 2005 for Game Boy Advance and DS. In the games, the player, who plays as Santa Claus, must knock down elves arranged as bowling pins as punishment for the elves going on strike due to the huge demand to create Christmas toys. The elves will blurt out various lines to distract the player, and animals such as reindeer and frogs can approach the track and even get hit by the ball. The game is filled with other various bizarre quirks thanks to the elves. The elves can moon the player, asking Santa who's your daddy, 
and can also move out of the way of the ball randomly, and one elf can even be decapitated by the pin setter. Both games were then combined by Ignition Entertainment under the title Elf Bowling 1 and 2, and this pack is what is often considered one of the worst games of all time. The gameplay loop was considered incredibly boring and tedious, with the elves and their antics quickly turning from somewhat amusing to extremely aggravating very quickly. GameSpot's review states that both games are completely devoid of gameplay, fun, and flair. However, even after this, six more editions of Elf Bowling were released for the PC, including Elf Bowling 3, Super Elf Bowling, and Elf Bowling Hawaiian Vacation, and these games even have a film adaptation titled Elf Bowling the Movie, The Great North Pole Elf Strike which starred Tom Kenny and is just a whole rabbit hole in and of itself. Saberspark made a pretty good video on that movie, so maybe go check that out. Burglar X Burglar X is a 1997 arcade beat-em-up title published by Unica Electronics Company Limited. Moby Games states that the objective of the game is to destroy enemies, collect objects and power-ups, solve puzzles, and defeat the final bosses which kind of just sounds like a whole lot of other games. You can choose to play as Gook Jung, a male player who attacks with his head, or Gook Soon, a female player who attacks with a mallet. Other abilities include the use of timed bombs, as well as farting, or as Moby Games puts it, toxic gas from your ass. Each of the game's five stages are split into five rounds where you collect collectibles, escape the enemy, and then defeat the final boss. So there is very little about this game online in terms of reviews or opinions, but the channel Rerez on YouTube did cover this game as a part of their Just Bad Game series, where they criticized the constant reuse of assets, the inclusion of a matching minigame, the tendency of enemies to overwhelm you at any time, and a lack of clarity on how to actually beat the bosses, where you have to headbutt a bomb into the bosses, which isn't something that that the game tells you to do. Overall, it seems like this is just a subpar arcade game from 1997 whose memory perhaps should be lost to time like farts in the wind. The Letter, Wii U. The Letter is a 2014 adventure mystery game and is the first title developed and published by Treefall Studios and was released exclusively for the Wii U. In the game, the player assumes the role of a young boy named Michael who receives a letter from his father. In the letter, his father states that he's been hired for a sketchy construction job and that he might be dead by the time the letter reaches his son, so Michael decides to go find him. The game acts as a narrative where Michael must discover clues and more letters to uncover the fate of his father. The game was created by a single man named Eli Brewer. He said he wanted to shake up the landscape of the Wii U's game selection, citing the lack of mystery horror games on the system. He developed the game part-time in about one to two months, where he earned $377 out of a $5,000 goal on Indiegogo. The reviews for this game were negative across the board, and the game was ranked as the fifth worst reviewed game on Metacritic with a score of 14 out of 100. Every single aspect of this game baffled critics with the lack of quality, including but not limited to the gameplay, presentation, story, and runtime. In fact, it would be far quicker to just list things about this game that did work for people, mostly because that list would have zero entries on it. Many people were wondering how Nintendo even approved the game to be sold on their eShop at all, as many did not even consider it to be a game. Despite the harsh reviews, the game does seem to be a genuine attempt by someone with a passion, and Brewer even released a statement thanking people for their support with the hope that he would eventually be able to learn from his mistakes and improve the game. Puli Rula Pu Li Ru La is a 1991 beat-em-up action game by Taito, initially released as an arcade game and then ported to the Sega Saturn, Playstations 1 and 2, and FN and and FM Towns Marty. Wait, what? FN Towns Marty? What the, what? I have no idea what that is. fifth generation home video game console released in 1993 for the Japanese market. Huh. Well, how about that? Alright, let's just get back to the video. Puli Rula is set in the fantastical world of a radish land, where time is regulated by a key held in each of the game's towns. An unnamed villain steals these keys, plunging the world into imbalance, and so the main characters Zack and Mel are given a magic stick from an old man in order to be able to navigate the world and get back the keys. Both the story and the visuals are basically a complete acid trip. One notorious level in the game has long female legs in the background with a 
literal lady door in between them, and understandably this part was actually removed for the international version of the game. Speaking of the international version, the translation from Japanese to English were apparently astonishingly bad, to the point that it kind of complemented the insane art style in a way. The gameplay for Puli Rula is very, very simplistic. Almost all enemies are defeated through only one hit, and the attack patterns are really easy to follow. Reviews seem to indicate that an experienced gamer looking for a sophisticated platformer might ultimately find the experience a pretty boring waste of time. But even though Puli Rula doesn't have too much going for it in regards to its gameplay, a lot of players seem to think its unique and bizarre visuals more than make up for it. Indeed, the quality of the art in Puli Rula makes it a confusing start to Tier 5, since this game actually has a lot of heart, and its gameplay could even be enjoyable for those just looking for a good time. Steel Harbinger Steel Harbinger is a 1996 multi-directional shooter developed by Mindscape Group for the PlayStation. The most unique parts of this game are the live-action cutscenes that give it a very campy, exaggerated aesthetic. It takes place in North America during the year 2069, Nice, where the US, Mexico, and Canada are all at war. Countless mecha alien pods suddenly shower down on North America, and the scientist Dr. Bowen decides to study them. Unfortunately, the pod he takes back to his lab escapes and attacks his daughter, Miranda, turning her into a human alien hybrid, the Steel Harbinger, who becomes humanity's last hope. She must battle the other aliens and rescue the humans with the end goal of activating a satellite that will prevent more alien pods from landing. In order to regain health, Miranda must eat the corpses of aliens and humans. Humans. The vast majority of reviews for this game are actually pretty positive. The cutscenes were considered very unique, and the levels were pretty expansive, with a lot of different enemies and weapons to use. Most reviewers are in agreement that the experience is okay, and that the game just needed a little more time to get fully polished. The most frustrating aspect of the game seems to be the top-down, pseudo-3D perspective of the camera. While you can turn your character to face any direction, the camera stays at a fixed perspective, with a lot of visibility north, but very little visibility south. That means that if enemies come at you from the bottom of the screen, you have very little time to react. Similar to Puli Ru La, the story and visuals are what make the game interesting, with the flawed execution of the gameplay being what holds it back. Life of Black Tiger Life of Black Tiger is a 2017 action survival game developed by One Games for the PS4 and mobile devices. In the game, you play as a black tiger that has been abandoned by his family and must fight humans and other animals like wolves in various natural locations such as tundras and forests. In one mission, I also think you have to mate with a female tiger. This game, obviously based on the footage, appears extremely simple, even amateurish, where the only gameplay for each level or stage is to fight some enemies, or complete some task and then you just win and move on. This game is probably considered notably bad because it's actually just a mobile game ported to the PS4 and PS5. One of the most interesting things about this game is what appears to be a kind of ironic, shitpost-esque cult following. The game has a pretty decent 7.2 user score on Metacritic with tons of people giving the game 10 star reviews, praising the plot and the lessons it teaches about the nature of family and home, as well as how the graphics really show off the power of the PS4. Similar comments can also be found on gameplay videos for the game on YouTube. My favorite review is by MikeZilla Games, where he laments the fact that the life of Black Tiger does not last forever and that while playing the game, colors feel more vivid and food tastes better and you feel a constant state of arousal. Block Warriors Open World Game Block Warriors is an open world, uh, action-adventure game developed by Cyber Gaming and published by Voltornas Games for the PC in 2017. The game appears to be a GTA clone but with a Minecraft-like blocky art style. The game has a character customization system and you can buy and use various guns and cars to do things around the game's urban setting. There also appear to be systems in place for the player to own businesses and property and also rob places and fight gangs just like in GTA. Like a lot of games on this final tier, professional reviews for Block Warriors are pretty scant. Players seem to think that the game was just poorly made, in case you couldn't tell from the footage, with gameplay problems including the lack of tutorials or direction, poorly made or implemented combat and driving systems, limited customization, ugly art style and characters, and also the fact that the game was just poorly translated from Russian to English. It seems that this iceberg and other places online refer to the game with open world in quotes because yeah, the game is technically open world, but the open world is extremely limited and not really high quality. However, most people seem to be pretty okay with the price, which is two US dollars. Although I did find this review on Steam where a person received the product for free and still went and refunded the game. Wars and Roses. Okay, so just a heads up, this entry is slightly not safe for work, so if you want to skip this one, just jump to this timestamp. Alright, are we good? Good. 
Wars and Roses is a first-person shooter developed and published by Blaze Worlds for PC in 2021. The game's page on Steam describes the game as a one-of-a-kind intense tactical FPS where you fight battles alongside female officers and interact with those beauties in a 3D dating sim. So basically, you fight alongside these female NPCs that you can recruit or even capture and then must seduce them through a dating sim puzzle to add them to your team. I never thought I'd get to bear witness to a game that's Rainbow Six Siege fused with Honey Pop, but here we are. Most of the user reviews seem to be focused not on criticizing the bizarre premise, but the fact that the game is just a buggy, unpolished mess and seems to have been abandoned by its developers, as the last update was in March 2022. Other criticism seems to be directed towards the repetitive gameplay, poorly written dialogue, or the fact that the um, adult scenes weren't animated well enough. Yeah, a lot of these reviews are kind of lamenting the lack of quality concerning the more adult elements. I guess the kind of people buying and playing these kind of games already know what they're getting into. The Graveyard. The Graveyard is a 2008 walking simulator developed and published by Tale of Tales. In the game, you play as an old woman who enters a graveyard, sits down, listens to a song, dies, and that's it. Sorry to spoil it for anyone who hasn't played it yet. Understandably, people reviewed this game pretty negatively, with many saying you could just watch a 10 minute playthrough of the game and it would basically be the same as playing it, except that that would be free and not cost $5 like the game. People also notice that there is a free demo available for the game, with the only difference being that the old woman doesn't die at the end. Some people did appreciate the more artsy nature and emotional weight of the game, likening it to a walking painting, but most people seem to agree that it was just a complete waste of money and time. I also want to note that there are a couple of reviews on Steam from people who have logged hundreds or thousands of hours in this game, so I guess there's something about it that people keep coming back to. Slaughtering Grounds the Slaughtering Grounds is a 2014 first-person shooter developed and published by the infamous Digital Homicide Studios. This is the developer's first release on Steam, and the game involves the player shooting zombies, where the player wins one of three levels if they survive for 16 minutes and 16 seconds. The game was heavily criticized for its use of assets from the Unity Asset Store, giving the game a low-quality feel. The most notable part of this game is that once the negative reviews inevitably started pouring in on Steam, the creators of this game actually tried to sue people on Steam that gave the game negative reviews, as well as even a professional reviewer named Jim Sterling who also reviewed the game negatively. Needless to say, none of these lawsuits ever actually went anywhere. The game also appears to actually not be on Steam anymore, probably as a result of this controversy. The story of Slaughtering Grounds is just a single piece in the bizarre puzzle of the history of Digital Homicide Studios, which I won't go into right now for the sake of time, but Frederick Knudsen made a fantastic video about the studio in his Down the Rabbit Hole series, and I would definitely recommend checking that out. Uriel's Chasm Uriel's Chasm is a 2014 indie game developed and published by Rail Slave Games and published on Steam. It's a game that has confused and terrified many, but has nonetheless captured a lot of attention. To say this game is an acquired taste may be an understatement. Looking through the Steam reviews, people who have played this game have described it as deeply unsettling, unplayable, and frustrating, with one review describing it as entering a cult. To some extent, that statement appears to be true. Its description on Steam describes it as a religious deprogramming tool, but it's not really a game to those who actually enjoyed it, who called it an experience. The actual game is about someone named Sister Tabitha, a religious space-traveling savior trying to find an orbital monastery that has mysteriously disappeared. You play as Sister Tabitha in a mishmash of pixelated retro games, a top-down shooter, a side-scrolling shooter, and a platformer. The controls are reportedly pretty janky, and you can't save at any point during the entire game, but that's only the half of it. Between these levels, you are also following a meta-narrative through lengthy live-action cutscenes. You have to watch long clips in the game of these two girls called shovelware reviewers who are playing the game itself and are complaining about how bad it is. As the game progresses, its religious themes grow stronger and it continues to get more disturbing, culminating in a confrontation with a final boss. The concept itself of Uriel's Chasm doesn't sound half bad, but the execution was not well received. Currently, it costs $4.99 on Steam and the game runs for less than half an hour, half of which is just videos of two girls talking. It's unsurprising that most people don't recognize much potential artistic merit in this because it punishes the 
a player too much for playing the game. The art is pretty eclectic, the audio is poor, the gameplay is boring, and the text on the screen is unreadable at times. Perhaps that's the point, that the game is meant to make you frustrated, but if that's the case then it might go a little too far. Games like Doki Doki Literature Club and Undertale have similar meta moments where the game kind of makes fun of the player for playing, but it works in those cases because the actual gameplay and story around it is cool and interesting. Uriel's Chasm just doesn't have those quality elements to back it up. To a few, it's an avant-garde experience, but even they might shy away from calling it a good game that's really worth the price. Alright, so this penultimate entry is going to be short and sweet. Super Fight was a beat-em-up game made by LGE on Steam in 2020. I'm saying made with quotation marks because this entire game is just a template from the Unity Asset Store that this guy put on Steam for $200. It's one level that takes about one minute to play. You beat up a couple of enemies and that's about it. So it costs $100 to publish a game on Steam and the Unity Asset costs for this were about $95 so I guess this guy's just trying to get his money back. It seems like the developer of this game just wanted to see if anyone would be stupid enough to buy it. And of course, people bought it because they just wanted to see what it was. Thankfully the game isn't on Steam anymore, but the fact that it was even approved in the first place is pretty hilarious. War of Three Kingdoms Okay, so this final entry requires a lot of background information, so strap in. War of the Three Kingdoms is a Chinese strategy game made by the developer War of Three Kingdoms is the number one lowest rated game on Steam right now, with over 19,000 negative reviews, most of which are in Chinese. In order to figure out exactly how we got here and why so many people hate this game, we actually need to go back to the year 200 in ancient China. So one of the most well-known historical periods in China is the the Three Kingdoms period, which lasted roughly from the year 200 to 300 AD. During this period, China was split into three states, each with a different ruler who claimed sovereignty over all of China. But what's important to us here is that a guy named Luo Guanzhong in the 14th century wrote a historical fiction book based on this time period called Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which became one of China's most famous novels and is still a classic today. Everyone in China knows this story. Think of it as like Lord of the Rings, but even bigger because the story is roughly based on some actual history. So for hundreds of years people have been obsessed with this story across East Asia and thus there have been countless different adaptations and pieces of media that have adapted this story including various games. Most notably in 2008 a Chinese company called Zika Games created a trading card game based on this story called Sanguosha or Legends of the Three Kingdoms. It's a strategy card game where you play as the historical characters in the classic novel with different win objectives. Sounds fun but the actual rules of the card game were allegedly stolen from a 2002 Italian card game called Bang. Although the case was dismissed in court, the similarities are definitely there. Even though the core mechanics of the card game might not have been very original, the addition of the Three Kingdoms story made it wildly popular in China and it even went international, with people all around the world translating the cards in order to play. This eventually inspired online versions of the card game, which also became widely popular in their own regard. Finally, we come to War of Three Kingdoms, which released in 2021. This was one of the many, many, many online iterations of this specific card game. Looking at the Steam page, the art honestly looks not bad, and there's even an animated trailer for the game. So why all the negative reviews? Well, as it turns out, this particular version is the most soulless, money-sucking abomination that you might have ever seen. It's basically impossible to win unless you just throw a constant stream of money at it. A lot of the good characters are just completely blocked behind a paywall even though the game itself is free to play. The game is also reportedly rife with bugs and other balance issues. Most of the Steam reviews are in Chinese, but people are so adamant about how terrible it is that they have taken it upon themselves to translate their reviews into multiple languages, decrying the pile of dog shit that they believe the game is. What ultimately makes this game truly terrible, it seems, is that it took a story that so many people have universally loved for hundreds of years and spent so much money on art and voice acting and all these bells and whistles and then basically just turned it into a shitty mobile pay-to-win gotcha game. Reading through these reviews, you can just smell the agony that these people have gone through playing it. Centuries upon centuries of adoration for this story, used for the most inane garbage imaginable. It seems that War of Three Kingdoms may just possibly be the worst video game of all time. Alright guys, well that is the worst video games ever iceberg explained. Once again, I'd like to thank Mr. Someone on Reddit for making this iceberg chart, as well as my wonderful girlfriend for helping me write a few of these entries, as well as helping me with the Chinese for the last entry. 
We covered some pretty interesting topics today, especially closer to the end. I had a lot of fun putting this video together, even though it was a lot of hard work. If you guys want to see me make some more, let me know down in the comments, especially if there's an interesting topic or chart that hasn't been covered yet here on YouTube. I may or may not already be working on another big iceberg video for a chart that I've come up with myself. Feel free to check out some of the other stuff on my channel. I mostly just make Star Wars content right now, but I'm looking to branch out. Most of all, I just want you to thank you so much for watching all the way to the end, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.